Hello and welcome to the BBXX podcast. I'm your host, Sasha Laurie, and we're here to bring you the life education that you didn't get at home or in school about sexuality, intimacy, and communication. On today's show, we're talking with Peggy Ornstein. We're going to be learning about young women's sexuality, the negative effects of pop culture and the media, and how the Dutch are basically better sex educated at 14 years old than the average adult in the U.S., It's easier to talk about girls as potential victims than as agents of sexual pleasure. There's this incredibly sexualized culture where the ultimate thing is to be hot, and that's the ultimate validation. And that is sold to girls as the form of personal empowerment and sexual expression, even though we know every bad psychological thing that can happen to you is a product of self-objectification. Peggy is a New York Times best-selling author of the book Girls and Sex, has been featured on NPR's All Things Considered, and was named by the Columbia Journalism Review as one of the 40 women who changed the media business in the past 40 years. Learn more on our website and social media at bbxx.world. About the research that you did, the conversations mm-hmm. you had, what were kind of some of the more... I know we've learned about the some of the negative consequences and where our culture is today, how things have gotten worse. Are there any ways in which it's gotten better? And and how? (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Um, Um, Well, you know, I think obviously the fact that we are now differentiating between sex and rape is definitely better, you know? And I think it's really interesting to talk to people generationally because young women and to an increasing degree young men have a much more nuanced definition of sexual assault than people who are parent age, their parents mm-hmm. do. And and parents will always like, it's amazing how people develop scripts, you know, and, and when you interview people, you find that people say the exact same thing, the exact same way right. all the time. Yeah, and, same script. And so people who are like the age of parents of college students are always saying, I don't know. I mean, you know, the stuff my kid talks about, I just, I don't know if I would say like, and when I was young, we would just say, you know, that was bad sex. And like, I think they, they all say it the same way. It's so interesting. But I find myself sometimes thinking, how do I think about what the story that this person is telling me, mm-hmm. you know? But I think that young people are much more advanced. Mm-hmm. And that they are creating new ground rules and demanding new ground rules. And I think that's really cool. And speaking of kind of that culture of consent and a little more into pop culture as well and the influence of the media, the movie Liberated, mm-hmm. the documentary on Netflix for anybody listening who's not familiar. I remember a friend recommended it to me and the way she described it to me was it's a movie about this new wave of feminism and kind of the media's effects on it. And what it is, is that these young girls, women think that, you know, looking at people beyond say, I don't even know who all the popular people are now, Rihanna, these videos that are so sexual, it's empowering. You know, you can go out and sleep with whoever you want. You can have casual sex. You can, you know, not give a fuck or have feelings attached But then at the same time, these people think that's what they're supposed to be because that's what they see in the media, but they're not. Right. So they then, it's this like backwards trying to be more progressive, more empowered, but then they're just trying to pretend that they are something they're not. It's a performance of sexuality. And then they go and they feel terrible inside. Mm -hmm. They have all this cognitive dissonance where they're doing things they don't actually agree with or regret, but then again, just trying to pretend to be something they're not. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, that was the whole, you know, crux of what I was writing, right? That you're entitled to engage, but not to enjoy. Right. And that the idea... And also entitled to to not engage, not even in terms of consent, but like you can be what people might call prude. And, you know, that is just as being a feminist because you're doing what you want and right. what you believe or in. What you think you want and believe in. I mean, and that's it's so complicated. I would ask girls all the time. You know, and I think that's the thing that that there's this incredibly sexualized culture where the ultimate thing is to be hot. And that's the ultimate validation. Right. And 
Yet, and that is sold to girls as the form of personal empowerment and sexual expression, even though we know that self-objectification, every bad psychological thing that can happen to you <laughs> is a product of self-objectification, you know? Yeah. So it's such a bait and switch in your head that when you reduce yourself to your value being your body, yeah, you're going to get a lot of attention and it's going to feel ultimately really crappy to you in mm -hmm. the end. And what really interested me in that film was that they had these girls who were like doing the bikini contest and all these people, you know, yelling, take your top off, take your top off. And then they switched to them and they actually had a really sophisticated analysis of the whole thing. That was crazy to me. I actually, so I watched the movie and for anybody listening who hasn't seen it, I basically can't describe how disturbing the movie is. Really disturbing. And like, I actually felt sick mm -hmm. throughout the movie and afterwards I couldn't stop thinking about it. It's it's sickening. It's very disturbing. But at the same time, it is so profound. Yeah, so real. It is so real in the reflections that mm -hmm. not only the girls and the experts featured, but it is so profound yeah. in a way that I honestly think that anybody over the age of 13 should watch this film yeah. or be required to watch this film because there's no way that after watching Liberated on Netflix, you could possibly think that's what you want to be. Right. And that's what the media is feeding you. And, and it's so easy to buy into it. It's totally. not anybody's fault. But if you watch this movie, there's no way anybody could think, I want to be like right. this kind of some of the pathetic and just terrible people who are featured in. There's right. no way. And girls would say to me all the time, you know, isn't there a difference between, you know, they would call it dressing slutty, but mm -hmm. you're just give it their language, you know, dressing slutty because for yourself versus doing it because of media pressure versus, and I, I would say, sure. Okay. Well, what's, how do you tell? Mm -hmm. And they would just kind of go, I don't know. I spend my whole life trying to figure that out, you know, or, or a girl who said, you know, I, I love, you were talking about Beyonce. I love Beyonce. I think she's amazing. You know, I think she's, she's like a queen. I love her, but I always wonder, could she say the things she said if she doesn't look the way she looks? Right. High school girls like look at that and they think that, and that's the contradiction that that's the line they're walking. That's the contradiction they're living with. You have to keep asking yourself or a girl who showed me a picture of herself going to a sorority party or a right. fraternity party. And she's wearing, you know, the, what those girls all wear, you know, like crop top and little skirt and five inch heels. And she said, I never feel, it was, she used the word liberated. She said, I never feel more liberated than when I'm wearing skimpy clothes. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, tell me more. And then she said that, as we talked, she said five years or I mean, excuse me, a year ago, she wouldn't have worn the same outfit because she was 25 pounds heavier. And she was afraid that she said, I, I was afraid that some assholey guy would have called me the fat girl. And that would have been bad for my mental health. So, I mean, first of all, like setting aside why being called the fat girl is the worst thing that could happen to her. Right. But you have to ask, okay, so it feels really good, of course, to have the right body. Right. And show that off. Of course, you get attention. That feels empowering. But who defines, but who defines the, the right, right body? body? Right. And under whose, what circumstances right. and how liberating is it if humiliation lurks right around the corner? So girls are always navigating that and like going back and forth and forth and back. And meanwhile, none of that is about how they feel in that body. And not to mention that the most attractive thing of all is confidence. So really, you have the control over all of that in the way that but they think but you're sold the idea yeah that that's what confidence is mm -hmm. and if it were if those girls then you know were having great sex having a voice feeling like they could you know truly create their own script yeah i would say okay then i'm wrong but the confidence comes off with the clothes right right when it should be the opposite yeah and instead you get you know uh, you get rates of depression, rates of anxiety, you get spectatoring where instead of being in their body during sex, they're watching themselves from the outside and thinking, should my leg go here? Does my leg go there? What is my hair doing? You know, and right, certainly they're not the having only orgasms. One noticing that. Yeah, they're the only one noticing faking orgasm, not having orgasms, right. not knowing what orgasm is. You know, I mean, there's, it's like, it's, there's so many strands that collude into women learning that sex is not really about their embodied feeling that it's about how they look when they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to keep... Make it look like yeah, they look. Yeah, the performance. Right. Not the feeling. And I just feel like at every step of the way, if we have girls in our lives, we've got to interrupt that. 
we've got to work with them on critique. We've got to work with them on feeling. And, and I think that people do more talk to girls about, especially in a social media world, about the falseness of the image, but they don't do the other piece, which is talking to them about feeling good in their body, that their body is there for their pleasure, that they should be masturbating, that they should touch their body, that they should feel sensual in their body, that all these things that are about their feeling and their desire and their pleasure and stopping to locate that, that we don't talk to them about enough. And speaking of social media, I think that, you know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, social media, people put up things that aren't real, but they don't really actually process that everything you see on social media is just a perception of something that like most of it is not real, whether it's the filter, whether it's the angle or the lighting or the clothes or the caption, just none of it is real, but people really forget to be reminded of that. And even in a way, all the stories you hear and the, not rumors, but the self-fulfilling prophecies Mm -hmm. in a way are this social media in terms of word of mouth being a form of media that again, people don't realize it's scripted. Right. It's also not real. I remember talking to my daughter when she doesn't like when I talk about her anymore, but when she was in eighth grade, they went on a field trip to the beach and we live in the Bay Area. So the beach is freezing, right? The beach is not yes. warm. And one of the girls took a picture, with, had her bathing suit on under her clothes and took her clothes off, Felt took a selfie sunny. and then put their clothes back on. Yeah. And my daughter just said, you know, it was freezing. That's out literally there. Was a just, metaphor for life in every yeah. bikini catalog you've ever right? seen. It was totally fake. And I said, please, honey, remember that moment, you know, because that, that's it's exactly what social media is. It's pretending that it's warm and sunny and you're wearing the bikini and feeling good. And then but you're immediately, really good, clinically depressed. And you're in freezing, the clouds, right? you know? Yeah. yeah. And you're the water's, alone. You're you need not, a you know? three inch wetsuit to go into the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So speaking about that script and, and the need to really be rewriting that script, you know, for parents, for young women, mm-hmm. young men, anybody in between all of those things. What kind of you mentioned some of the words of wisdom that you, you've you learned from these interviews mm-hmm. with these young women. How could we use, you know, what they've told you and some of these really insightful messages and observations to kind of start creating a new script? What are some of the things that we would put into that new script? Well, that's a really big question. I start, in some ways I start on a one-on-one I mean, I wrote a book in order for people to read it so they could yeah. start talking about yeah. <laughs> that new script. Or I encourage people when they have kids to have them watch the TED Talk that yeah. I did or listen to the Fresh Air podcast or this podcast. But and, in the, yeah, in the words of some of the young girls. It. The book itself with the yeah. words of the girls, what I wanted was to create like sort of like a window and a mirror mm-hmm. so that people and young people in particular, boys and girls, could look into it and see other people's experience, but also see their own experience reflected. Mm -hmm. And I get so much email. I get tons of email from girls and I get email from boys too that read, you know, and and again, I I sort of, I don't want to force, you know, there's other ways, but a lot of young people who read the book who feel like it's changed their paradigm. Mm-hmm. And change the way that they want to move forward and look at these and re- and prioritize the idea of reciprocity and mutuality and sexual ethics, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I just – and there are really wonderful curricula. It's not reinventing the wheel. I mean, there's really great resources out there. Our whole lives is really inexpensive. The Population Council has a great curricula. For parents on my website, which is just my name, I have just oodles and oodles and oodles of resources – for people to, but you know, ideally to change the script, you're not starting when your child is 17 or 18. You can, but ideally you're starting when they're born and you're naming their body parts and you're saying, you know, you know, preschoolers, if you have one, they masturbate all the time. Right. And you say like, it feels really good to touch your vulva, but we don't do it at grandma's Thanksgiving table. It's something that we do in our room. You know, right. you sir, you say it. It's it's just part of the conversation. Right. It's part of the conversation. And, you know, I know that when I was writing Girls and Sex that I think I started when my daughter was 10 or 11. I can't remember. And I realized after a year or so that I hadn't told her what I was writing about. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, 
And I asked her if she knew and she said, no. And I saw I'm writing about a book called Girls and Sex. And she said, well, that seems like a good idea. And I said, yeah. Do you know that some girls don't even know what their clitoris is and that it's for making good feelings, that that's what it's for? It's only purpose. Yeah, that's its only purpose. Because she had already learned that in school. I had seen, I had sat in on her puberty. One of the lucky ones. Yeah. So she was probably in sixth grade by this time. And she said, that's interesting, mom. Can we please talk about something else? (laughs) And we did. But, you know, we continue and do continue to this day to have these conversations all the time. And the more I saw that she had sent a text to a friend where I had a new book that's out called Moan, Anonymous Stories of Female Orgasm. And it was sitting on the dinner table just because I had just gotten it, you know, in the mail and I had just tossed it there. And she had taken a picture of it and sent it to a friend and said, this is the kind of book that's laying around my house. <laughs> and I think it was a little bit of, of humble book. bragging, you yeah. know, but it's just normal. It's just normal conversation in our house because right. why wouldn't it be? Right. Just normalizing why something that should be. Why wouldn't it be? Like statistically speaking, the number of people who have sex in the world, it has to be one of the most normal things yeah. that exist. Right. And so why, why can't we talk about why it? Why wouldn't if it she, is? why wouldn't you just have, you know, normal conversations about the existence of female orgasm, about what a clitoris is, about what you expect from a relationship, you know, about not getting into high drama situations in a relationship where somebody's going out with somebody else, but says they really want to be going out with you, you know, like all these things. Why wouldn't you just be talking about that as a matter of course in your child rearing? I don't understand that. Right. What is it you're afraid of? And that's kind of what BBXX is trying to provide a bit of that education too, that you don't get at school or at home about relationships from anything from sexuality to yeah. intimacy and communication. And kids, they desperately want it. And they mm-hmm. say that all the time. Every survey says, yes, you know, they want information about sexuality, but they also really want information about relationships. And one of the things that was interesting, again, going back to the Dutch with boys, there's a book called Non Under My Roof by Amy Shallot about comparing Dutch and American experience in the way that we talk about sex and the way we raise our kids around this. And one of the things that she said was that where love was concerned, that Dutch boys assume their capacity for love. They say, well, of course you would want to love. You know? just and American boys think they're the exception. Like all my friends just want to hook up, but I really want to love somebody. Yeah. That is so profound. I know. So it's, you know, it's the way we're raising our kids here and it's not, doesn't have to be this way. And there was a point in history after the sexual revolution, when the pill came along, et cetera, what we call the sexual revolution, which was really half a revolution, but still the Dutch looked at that and said, this has happened. We need to make sure that, that kids are engaging in a positive way. And they did this massive reform of sex education. And that's why they have what they have. At the same time, and before the the sexual revolution, American and Dutch attitudes towards premarital sex were the same. So they just went, okay, life has changed. Let's make it happen. Let's make it work. The Americans went into this highly politicized state where sex education became the, the ground zero battleground for our moral souls or something. So on one side, we had people who were just trying to make it stop. And on the other side were people who weren't doing that, but they also didn't want it to do what the Dutch did. They tried to retain what they could by coming at it from a perspective of danger. And that's why what we call comprehensive sex education is all about risk and danger, because that was the only weapon that they had against this moral argument that it was bad. And it neither has served, neither the abstinence only nor truly the risk danger model has served our kids very well. Yeah. So I think going back to that script and it being such a process Mm -hmm. and just storytelling really, storytelling really being at the root of all this. Or even doing things like I've seen in sex ed classrooms where they take scenes from teen movies like the, you know, like Super Bad or American Pie or whatever kids are watching and sex scenes and they just break them down like how did they negotiate consent? Did they negotiate consent? Who is enjoying what? We're taking the scene from like Animal House. Yeah. I don't know if you've watched Animal House recently. Right. Well, there's this one scene where Tom Hulse, who's like the nice boy, the virgin boy, he's trying to have intercourse for the first time. And so he gets this girl drunk and she passes out. And there's this whole scene where there's like the little angel and the little devil on his shoulder arguing about wow. whether he should have intercourse with her or not. And it's like, it's supposed to be funny. That's. Terrible. I mean, there's so many scenes that aren't even like 
we don't have the baseline of consent in these things. So having, you know, talking about it through the media is one way to approach it. Talking about real or, or teachers who gather real world scenarios over the years from their kids mm-hmm. and have the kids talk them through. What would you do? What do you do if you're in the car and you say, I love you and your partner doesn't say it back? What happens then? You know, like just having a conversation about that with a group of kids is an interesting thing to do. There's so many really great ways that I've seen to approach these issues and challenge the script. And then, you know, I would wish that Hollywood, now that we're, I've been thinking about writing about this, we're having this big Me Too movement. How about changing the literal script? How about changing the scripts in Hollywood for sex so that the symbols that they use indicating that sex has happened are different? Because right now, or that pleasure has happened yeah. are different rather than just that scene, the classic scene where they roll in different directions. Right. Like, oh my God, that was the greatest thing ever. But we actually have no idea what After happened. having intercourse up against a wall long. with nothing else going on, not even. Right. I mean, I, I say that all the time that people talk about porn and I certainly have to talk about that with your kids. But I remember seeing a scene just like that where it was like, kiss, kiss, kiss. Everybody rips their clothes off. They have intercourse. There's nothing besides kissing to intercourse in the missionary position for approximately 10 seconds. And they're done. And everybody's had an orgasm. And I'm like, whoa, that's no more realistic than porn. And so I said to my daughter, you know how when they show a cab ride in a movie, they show people getting into the cab and then they show people getting out of the cab, but they don't show the whole cab ride because that would be irrelevant. That would be boring. Similarly... When sex happens in a movie, Hollywood has invented these symbols that indicate sex and pleasure have occurred, but they have absolutely nothing to do with what happens between two people. And P.S., they are totally from a male gaze perspective. And what happens in between shouldn't be as boring as the taxi ride. Otherwise, you need to... Well, that too. But it would be (laughs) boring to sit there and watch it in a movie, and it would kind of take us away from the plot. And I get it. But we have to find a different way to indicate that a sexual encounter has occurred between two people in a movie. And I think it's so, I did an interview with one of my good friends. She's an actress and she talked about how much she used to love movies as a girl and kind of rewatch the sex scenes. And it was like, again, again, again. And then she got to the age where she was having sex and she just felt so betrayed. And she goes, you know, it's two seconds, nor a hand near anything near a vagina, no foreplay. Two minutes later, everybody is coming as if it's the most mind-blowing thing ever, and then it's done. And she also talked about, though, for men, how everything portrayed in the media is the scene of them having sex, and it's day, and it's night, and it's day, and it's night again. And she goes, I mean, that's not fair to men at all, because there are literally so many young boys, men, who think, well, I can't have, you know, 18 orgasms in a day and have sex for two hours each time. And she goes, I mean, if you watch that and you think that's remotely real, what penis, tell me what penis where in the world is capable of doing that? None. Zero. And they do definitely, that is definitely something boys talk about too. So yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing. The Just pointing out the lack of realism, I think, is doing kids a service because Nobody does. So, you know, one scene I remember that really challenged that, though, was there was this movie in the 80s called The Big Easy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw that. It was Dennis Quaid and Ellen Barkin, and he's a cop and she's a DA. And there is the hottest sex scene in that movie that is totally – she's very uneasy and it's, it's, and he, it's just all about her. Amazing. And you so rarely see that. And I remember at that time just thinking, oh, my God, I've never seen that on screen. It is the sexiest. you got to go find it. I'm sure it's on yeah. YouTube. Perfect. We're it's it's like rated. Video. It's probably still rated PG even though it's, you know. It should be. People should. Well, that too, but they, that. they don't, you know, I don't right. think they really show anything. It's a good movie too. Well, I think that just goes back again. So in conclusion, just the, the need in to change conclusion. that script, but changing the script through real stories, changing, you know, what we perceive as real, the media, and actually creating the realness through perspective, through, you know, conversations and sharing. Mm -hmm. And seeing these things is like seeing, you know, these conversations about Me Too and conversations about sexual pleasure and conversations as consent. I mean, it's it's in making sure that we're not only talking about girls as victims, because I think in this very weird way, we're more comfortable with that. And it's easier to talk about girls as potential victims than as agents of sexual pleasure, of their own sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, for all you listening, 
You can check out Peggy's latest book, Girls and Sex, one of her New York Times bestsellers, and get some more insight onto learning more about the stories and how to help shape your own and share it to help everybody change the script. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to the BBXX podcast. You can learn more on our website or on our social media at bbxx.world. And if you believe in what we're doing, please do help spread the love by sharing this with someone you care about. Until next time, BBXX.